the regulation is taking shape. So yes, we're going to have a speaker from SEC talking more about this, but I'm pretty sure that everyone has noticed that thanks to these uh, recently introduced regulations, a lot of exciting movements are going to take place in Bangkok. So of course, with the e-payment and QR code standardization, this is going to be an exciting platform for a lot of fintech and blockchain companies to tap in. And we have a variety of players coming in field. You can see that we have also Ripple, Omise, top banks in the country, a lot of foreign players and a lot of local players as well in diverse areas. So energy, um, finance, payments, and a lot of other industries. So we are talking about a very colorful picture of the blockchain space in here. And also with verticals, we are talking about tourism, stock exchange, IoT and all these exciting areas. So I'm pretty sure that, you know, as Thai people and also as Thailand facing businesses, this is going to be something very exciting in the future. And also we have uh, seen that the government has approved the Ikiko IC and digital ID platform, which will be implemented by middle of 2019 next year. So all these, all these interesting facts are going to be, you know, the drivers of future growth of blockchain in Thailand. And also we can see here that uh, the top banks have joined force in their Thailand blockchain community initiative, which is going to be one of the main, uh, one of the main uh, drivers of the blockchain growth in the country. And we've seen a strong participation of Japanese firms. So a lot of, I can see a lot of players from China and Japan are also coming here and they're also forming alliance with local players. Uh, you know, and also spearhead interest from all these private sector and banking sector in adopting blockchain. And last but not least, I would say that for now, enterprise blockchain solution is one of the latest trends where you can see that a lot of players from the government sector and state owned enterprises are also joining the game. So these are some of the basic observations about the market that we are looking at and some of the milestones that I think that you might have been aware of about this. So back in 2017, you can see that SEC Thailand has first introduced the guidance about ICO. So of course, this regulation has been hatched for quite some time. But then back in September 2017, that was the first time that they had the ICO guidance. And you can see along the way, there are a lot of adopters and a lot of banks joining the game from Chrome 3 to SCB. And also from February 2018, then JP Coy is the first listed company cryptocurrency. Uh, and they have started trading uh, in Thailand. So I think that these are some of the exciting milestones that I think that you can have a look at to see how the market has been moving and has been shaping up just in uh, half a year, just in six months. And back this year, of course, we are having more milestones to look at. Of course, in July 2018, this is the one of the big milestones of the market, but SEC has announced their first official regulation around ICO. And also we have noted that this news might not be you know, known to a lot of people because this just happened I think like a week ago. So SCB and Digital Ventures has for the very first time announced the partnership in, uh, procurement, in procurement application, procurement service based on blockchains. So for the very first time a semen company you know, in a very traditional business has partnered with Digital Ventures and they are trying to bring blockchain to supply chain and to procurement, which is a very exciting area for blockchain adoption. And uh, also back in May 2018, you can see that SCT is also, has also developed a crowdfunding platform based on blockchain. And this is a very bold movement to support the SMEs and startups in funding, in supporting with the funding because of course, uh, I think so far we were announced that it's very hard for startups to list, to get listed on stock exchange. And of course, it's very hard for them to access funding. So SET, for the very first time, has announced this platform to connect the institutional investors and other investors with the startups in Thailand, which is a very exciting and very bold move movement. And also for the ecosystem players, this is uh, you know the map that we have been putting quite a lot of effort in drafting for you. So later on, we're gonna share this report to those subscribed to ABR newsletter so that you can have a look at all these details. So we are now looking at the map from different, uh, in different categories. So we're talking about regulators, association, media influence, and community. Uh, I'll be 
our partner, our client, our friends at Big Coin. I think Thailand is going to showcase more about media and community later. But I myself will take you through the regulators and association. And here are some of the players in exchange, wallet, um, accelerator funding, and training and education. So you can see the whole map of what has been happening in Thailand. So now we're going to go in details about the blockchain startups and other companies. So just for your information, this is the draft report. So we are really sorry if your company is not in here because we cannot cover everything in two months. So my apology if your company is not here. So if you feel like, of course, your logo must be here, please come to us and we will try our best to revise this report as soon as possible. So these are some of the blockchain startups and other companies that are active in the space. Uh, and then we're going to have a look at the regulators. So right now, in our report, we have specified that there are five regulatory bodies who are active in blockchain regulation. So of course, we have Ministry of Finance, Bank of Thailand, who is also a very active adopter. And uh, they have made some announcement about their central bank digital currency, or CBDC which is definitely something underway that I think and Thailand definitely is one of the one of the few countries that walk their talk. So I was shared that of course the CBDC project is gonna be real. It's gonna be something real further underway. So of course we have SEC here who's in charge mostly with overseeing the offering of digital tokens and digital assets. And we have two other regulators, so SCT as another adopter with their crowdfunding platform and the Ministry of Revenue Department in charge of taxation on cryptocurrency and digital assets. So associate, associations here, we are having three major associations, so Thai FinTech, uh, Thailand Blockchain Association, and also Thai Bond Market Association. So this Thai BMA is also another active adopter with their bond registration um, platform. So moving to exchange, uh, we are just covering seven exchange which have been licensed by SEC here, although I'm pretty sure that there are more than this. But we are looking at the five major exchange which are now, which have been licensed plus two dealers. So it's also important for you to separate that we have exchange and we have dealer group. And um, I believe that there are more exchanges which will be regulated soon in the future. And also about startup, again, uh, we cannot cover all the startups in the space, uh, but we are just kind of, you know, sharing spotlights on some of the major startup that we think are very active and who are doing, who are walking their talk, who are doing something real in the market instead of making announcement. So Everex and Omisego, for all of these projects, we can notice that their ICO has, achieved, you know, has gone around $20 million plus. So they're both very active in payment space and remittance. Six network in Carbonium. Um, I think that there are also a very interesting case here with Carbonium where they already have an existing business. So Stock Raiders as their parent company have already got an existing user base. And right now they're going for Carbonium as a social trading layer, which can be integrated on Stock's Raider platform plus other businesses, which is also very interesting. Six network. Uh, with a very diverse, a very comprehensive ecosystem in digital and e-commerce. Also, we are talking about Cryptovation X and Zcoin, um, which are also very active in the market, just that they don't do ICO at this stage. The Cryptovation X has done their pre-sales, their private sales, and Zcoin is basically a protocol project, and they are also active in the meetup and community space. And last but not least, JFIN Coin. I think everyone here might have heard about it. So. Uh, it's also the first listed cryptocurrency in Thailand, um, and I hope that we will have more news and more updates about the business and products in the future. So, moving to other uh, players, ICO Advisory, we are listing Andrew Coin Icora here. Later you will hear from my friend Icora more about what they are doing and what they will be doing for the community in the future. So basically, we have ICO Advisory, we have mining companies, uh, and then uh, we are trying to give you some, like some pieces of the whole picture. So right now, that's only the desk research. We have done a small landscape survey among some of the major ecosystem players, trying to understand what they think about the market and what's going to be 
waiting for Thailand, uh, you know, along the way, further down the line. So this objective is to understand the overall ecosystem and what they think about the market and what is the potential of blockchain in Thailand. So here is a sample of our respondents. We have tried to collect a mix, a nice mix of respondents from different sectors. So technology, fintech, education. So we have respondents from major traditional banks like Asikon Bank or um, you know, and other accelerators like Rice and also like other blockchain companies like Everex or Bitcoop. So this is basically what they have come up with. So may, primarily the industry is prone to blockchain adoption, pretty much of course it's still fintech, but of course a lot of people are very bullish about blockchain in supply chain and in public services, also with energy, thanks to the recent, you know, recent business uh, project by BCBG. And also for expectation for blockchain, of course at the core of blockchain is still about solution to trust. But a lot of people are also trying to adopt blockchain thanks to its security and its transaction speed as well as cost efficiency features. And what are the challenges to blockchain proliferation in Thailand? So we have done this market and we can see that there's a nice mix of answers about the lack of a comprehensive ecosystem, low market awareness and lack of education initiative. But I believe that thanks to the recent you know, regulation on blockchain, we can see that there are quite a few, there are diverse portfolio players joining this place. So ICO advisory, exchange wallet, and also even we are gonna see more brokerage, more licensed brokerage and more licensed exchange in the future. So I believe that the ecosystem here is getting shaped better than ever. And then how can we poster the blockchain ecosystem in Thailand? Of course, we are also thinking about a lot of uh, you know, initiatives around uh, training, that's very important, training and education, because a lot of people also said that the awareness of blockchain in Thailand is still low. And then of course we need more initiatives from the government and more incentives uh, to grow the space. We also need more advocacy in terms of public for a better regulatory environment. And last but not least, it's a very important to connect the Thai blockchain ecosystem with the rest of the world. So, um, they are very bullish about blockchain movement in Thailand. Yes, I think 85% here is, think that it's gonna cry quickly thrive in the next three years, uh, which I think might be a bit biased because of course a lot of these players are already in the blockchain space, but I think that this is still a very impressive uh, figure given the recent crash of the market, given the recent uh, you know movement in other countries in the region. I think that still a lot of people still have faith in the technology and one of the reason that I think that it makes sense is that we have a full house event today. So I believe that when you come here, you also have some credits for the technology itself. So uh, what does the future hold? So this is basically what we have come up with in terms of uh, you know, outlooks. This is our you know, subjective um, observations about the future. It doesn't, it's not necessarily something that has been proven because it's about the future. But uh, we think that of course we have more licensed players, the license exchanges and ICO portal, that's definitely in the, in the immediate future. And then we're talking more about other types of crowdfunding. So ICO is pretty much not the hottest keyword for now, we can say. So if you're talking about ICO, it's not you know, what we are discussing now, we're talking about other types of crowdfunding. So SDO, securities token offerings, or DICO, or reverse ICO, meaning existing business who are now jumping to blockchain. We think that those are gonna be the next trends in the space. Also, we are seeing more interest from the government and the local corporates and SMEs. These are going to be the major players, the major adopters in the market. And also the community is looking for, is looking up to the government for more transparency. I think we have received quite a few remarks saying that right now it's still very hard to navigate in the space even the lack of transparency in terms of regulation. So I think that if the government is doing, if the government can do a better job, I think definitely that the, the community is gonna thrive much, much faster. And also last but not least, I think this question is an open-ended question. We, can, we do not have the answer because I think we need uh, a whole night tonight just to discuss about that. So with more regulations, will Thailand become more, will we become over-regulated or will it become the next blockchain hub for a lot of companies? So are there more companies coming in? Are there like more local players joining the market? I think that will be 
and that will be the open question for every one of us here uh, and something for you to ponder and something for you to think about. Hopefully after some drinks, then you can still think through and of course discuss about this with all of the people here and then we can see what's going to be waiting for us in the near future. So uh, just some words about us. We are Asia Blockchain Review. Uh, it's different from Blockchain Review, by the way. I <laughs> see it's a very serious. So just to differentiate ourselves, I have to make this very clear that we are Asia Blockchain Review. <laughs> Although we are not competitors, uh, but then this is uh, what we are now presenting. So we want to be the largest initiative for media and community. So we want to focus on community and media. We have launched our website. So what's different about us, of course? Other than all the things, you know, talking about conference, meetup, and press coverage, what we want to do is that we want to focus on untapped markets in Asia. So Vietnam, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, you know, we have seen news on a lot of other news platforms, Cointelegraph and whatever, all those news media. What we do differently is that we just don't feature news. We want to feature in-depth research into the market. We want to understand the landscape before we do anything else. So Thailand is going to be the first country that we are going to do this. Of course, other than, Thai, other than Vietnam, we have done this in Vietnam before. I'm from Vietnam, by the way. So we started off from Vietnam two years ago. And now we're coming to Thailand and we're going to start with this uh, landscape report first before going to, in, uh, to Malaysia tomorrow, Singapore Friday, and Manila next week. So every time, you know, with all these markets, we want to be the one who understands the market and the landscape as well as the locals so that we can advise the startups when they want to connect to these markets then you have the local insights the local network local expertise to be uh to you know to thrive in the market so um other than this uh, we have done quite a few things around the community uh we have been featured we have been media partner for around like 20 conferences so far and we're offering some uh, package some support for startups to feature on our site as well as for the event and organizer. So as I mentioned here, Bangkok is our first stop in this roadshow and we're going to other countries in the region in October and November. Uh, we will be hopping between flights and we are very interested in meeting you or your partners or your clients who are looking forward to expanding in Southeast Asia and Asia. So pretty much that's the main sketches of our uh, Landscape Report of Thailand. We are very happy to be here today and we also look forward to discussing with you about after this. So me and my uh, colleagues will be around, uh, you know, just to have a chat and see how we can support you as a media community initiative. So thank you very much for that. I hope I haven't run out of time. Uh, but again, please enjoy the night. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Nicole, for that. We will save um, Q&A for the last bit of our time here. So I want to welcome up our next guest speaker from Bitcoin Addict. Please, round of applause. <laughs> the stage is yours. That's pretty awkward. <laughs> All right, um, so my name is A, I'm representing the client today, and the client man, if anyone knows. Um, so basically, I'm going to talk about the town community landscape, you know, as to you know, what can be seen for me, and also, you know, like, um, who is actually in this space at the moment. And um, I will um, probably talk about some interesting stats <coughs> at the end. So um, first, right, um, why do we need a community? I mean, um, well, the answer is quite simple. If you're, you know, family basis here, if you're in this space for a while, <laughs> You know that there's so much scams, fake news, um, you know, pump and dump, you know, fraud. I don't even know what to say really, you know, market manipulation. And the answer is simple. Well, there's no one to protect us yet, right? Um, I'm talking about like uh, we have to protect ourselves as a community. I mean, me alone, I couldn't find out maybe, it's, you know, I missed out some of the red flag. Maybe I didn't know that someone got your white paper. Or maybe they, you know, they're trying to scam us, right? But together, right, what we can do is we can, you know, help each other out, you know. If anyone spots something, they can tell us in the community, right? So that's where the community come from, right? And uh, with the regulation that's coming up, um, I mean, the SEC is here, so, <laughs> uh, well, uh, I support regulation, okay? <laughs> well, um, I, I do support regulation. The reason is that, you know, it's another layer of protection, right? But what I'm trying to say is that even with the regulation, right, you can't really regulate something that, you know, See, I can send my money to peer-to-peer. -peer. 
in decentralized world, right? I mean, there's gonna be someone somewhere around the world trying to scam you anyway. You can't stop that. So with the community support plus the regulation, I'm sure that we can, you know, like avoid you know, all these scams, right? And it's not just that, really. Um, community doesn't just protect you from scams, but I'm talking about the common questions, right? We, we don't have CEO of Bitcoin, you know, answering your question, right? We don't have customer support. You talk about a decentralized network that, you know, like one by itself. So let's say, right, um, I'm new to this place, right? I might be, um, I might be familiar to the investment. I maybe trade forex, trade stock, but maybe I don't even know how to open a wallet. What is a private key, right? So comedy is helping out in this case, right? And also, if I'm a geek, right? I know all about the tech, but I never invest in it, you know, even once in my life. So that's where the comedy comes in as well. We help each other out. And with Thailand, right? It's a bit, you know, similar to, um, I would say, like Korea, um, Vietnam, right? Because we have a language barrier, we, we can admit that you know, like uh, most of our audience are the locals who you know maybe um, maybe um, prefer Thai language, right? So that's where our media and community come from, right? We try to provide the content in Thai. We try to get um, people together in one place and you know, chat with each other in Thai. And um, the community doesn't just pr protect us and help us with you know like our day to day you know, investment. We talk about it, the comedy is also important for the project. Well, why is that, right? You, if you are building a decentralized network, right, that run by itself, technically it doesn't run by itself. It runs by the community. I'm talking about the user, the developers, right, um, speculators, uh, miners, right. So I could say that your project is as alive as um, the community. Without community, your project won't stay for too long, correct? So they're just like your shareholder. So it's so important that the project you know, fly around the world as you can see, right, for the roadshow, um, for the event, just to you know, like meet their shareholders, right, to get their fans to, you know, to keep the company going. Right? So that's why like, uh, in Thailand as well, we, we actually help a lot of projects um, engage with their local fans and shareholders. Now, um, I may talk a bit about this already, about our role as a media and community manager. So for Bitcoin Attic, right, we started out as a media, right, just to provide you know, like one way information, educate people. But at one time, we realized not enough, right? Um, we, we need to build a community. I mean, just like I said before, like me alone cannot sustain this. So then we start growing the community. Um, the way we do it, it's just, you know, like, just like bring you guys, it's like what you guys do here, right? bring the friends that you know are interested in blockchain and cryptocurrency together. And then but when that time comes, right, you guys share information. Everyone help each other out. And we want to do it in a friendly and fun way, right? You can see, you know, like when moon hold or you know, uh, we, we try to, you know, you know this market is it's not a serious business, right? It's just, you know, <laughs> it's, um, So they're offline as well, right? And um, it's not just this. You have to realize that in community, right? Sometimes, right? You can't put everyone in one place. Right? Some people are interested in mining. Some people are interested in tech trading. Even in trading, there's some people interested in ICO. Some people are interested in, uh, um, let's say, short-term trading, swing trade. So we try to match people to the right group, right? And um, I believe like um, there's a lot of media and community here today that can direct you to the right one. Um, let's talk about the ecosystem a bit. Um, I think, as Nicole mentioned before, right? Um, we have these as a um, media influencer. Um, if I don't cover e everyone, just let me know. I'll add it in. <laughs> um, don't be angry. Um, so basically, right? Uh, we have the same goal. I would say um, we want to educate um, Thai people. We want to um, give them the right information, and at the same time, right, these media also create a community as well. So, you know, different people have different community. You can join all of them if you want, right? And um, for the station community, I would say that um, these are more like um, the places or, you know, like um, the event organizer, right? So, like Beachfish, for example, right? It could become a blockchain hub in Bangkok, right? Like maybe everyone trying to do that as well, right? We have Ethereum Thailand as well, that, you know, like I believe um, just organized um, this one day, right? With Ethereum Bangkok. Um, and we can actually see more and more events and meetups 
inside that. Anyway, it's pretty good. It's actually a good mix. Like for eBay, right, you can see that there's a lot of um, for foreign project coming into Thailand, set up an event. And um, actually, I want to highlight the Pizza Hackathon. This is the, I would say, it's the first uh, blockchain hackathon that organized by the locals, right? And uh, it's pretty successful and it's interesting. And in blockchain space, it's so hard to find a blockchain there, right? And you know, to be successful in uh, creating a something like Pizza Hackathon is uh, a great milestone for Thailand as well. Um, and for Meetup, we have a good mix of you know the expat Meetup, you know Thai Meetup. Um, I don't know, like somehow, like we, we don't go along or something. <laughs> um, um, so we, we kind of split, but you know, like 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 today, right? I'm sure like some of the locals, some of the you know like um, expat are here as well. Um, you know, so uh, we we have some you know that doing every month, some actually every week. Now, um, I think I will just end this with um, some interesting stuff that we gather in our community. Um, these are all actually, instead I will say first, our community focus on ICO investment and trading. So in here, uh, I'm talking about the investment here, right? So we can see that most of the investors are under 30, uh, more than 60% actually. And it's pretty interesting that what you're talking about um, the millennials that start investing into this, maybe they just buy parts of the stock and forex starting here, right? And um, the network, I'm talking about cryptocurrency network, yeah? Not, not um, the actual network. So a lot of people, uh, well, more than 50, oh, that's a big number actually, that's like 86% hold uh, up to 10 BBC, that's, that's quite impressive. I don't know how much they have now though. This was <laughs> down too much, right? so it could be lower, right? Um, investment size, this one is ICO investment. So as you can see, right, fifty-one percent actually throw one e into you know most of the project. Um, we have a few whales, I guess, but yeah, not too much. Then um, lastly, uh, my last stats, right? <laughs> 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 well, you can see in this room as well, right? So um, I would love to encourage more female um, to be into this space. Um, we pretty much lack of female, really. So yeah, um, I think that's, that's it for me. Um, hope you guys enjoy my presentation. And if there's anything, um, we can talk afterwards. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yes. Yes. Already our next speaker is pumped and ready to talk about this topic. All right, I'm gonna give you the stage. And, and also the clicker. Oh, okay, all right. Uh -huh. Uh, hi everyone, I'm from Sanjay from Icora. As you can all see, the community is growing here. A lot of meetup going on every day, so we can see like new faces as well. Rather than hanging out with the old pla old faces quite often. <laughs> so today I'm going to talk about a bit about ICO portal, whether it's very friendly or whether it acts as a just factor to the ICO in the ICO market currently. So. So let's start it off with a rough agenda today. So like I'm going to talk about what and why do we need a portal, uh, the process of going through the ICO portal, uh, the pros and cons, and some outlook of the ICO portal. So basically, uh, I would like to focus on like uh, also can do a bit sharing afterward, right? If you guys have any question about going through the portal, looking to do an ICO, feel free to come up and have a chat. So let me ask this question first. Like, uh, any any of you new in Thailand? Just recently moved here, or okay, the one of you, Nicole. So maybe I pick on you then. The first time you heard of the word ICO portal, right? What do you think of it? Have you heard of it before? Sounds very digital. Um, Sounds very what? <laughs> hmm. Not real. Not real, right? So what happened is the first time I heard ICO portal, right? Me and my colleague were discussing what they mean by portal, ICO portal. Is anything around in this world called ICO portal? So I went to Google, right? I Google ICO portal. So nothing also came up. So it was like, yeah, what, what does it actually mean? So if you go to like reference, it's according to the uh, document by the SEC, right? In the Thai, so I roughly translated it out, might be a bit wrong, not sure, right? So basically it's a digital token issuer service provider which they define as uh, ICO portal. Uh, you can add by five 
licensed or approved by the Security and Exchange Commission. So ICO portal is a group of uh, a company which is being approved by SEC to kind of like uh, scan ICO or do some due diligence on the ICO in a layman term kind of thing. So it's still very vague with this uh, meaning because they have a huge document. So you have to really drill down inside to really understand what the portal is. So after I heard this info, right, I was Googling also like thinking of like uh, where this idea came from. So I came up with a bit of two theory within my personal opinion, right? So we can have a look at like a Binance Launchpad, which is quite similar concept to an ICO portal. And you can look at the Indiegogo crowdfunding site, which uh, can be like Indiegogo of the ICO world, basically. So it's more like a crowdfunding portal. You can click in, have a couple of ICO there, invest in ICO and see what the project is about doing. So that's our rough take on what the ICO portal is. But then the process of getting listed there, I'll have a talk about it, like what's the whole process. So the first part is, uh, why do we actually need a portal? What, why was this created in the first place? So basically from what happened in the current market, especially in Thailand, right? There was a couple of cases where there was a lot of scam going on. Like for example, BitConnect came and did an event here in Thailand. So I don't know if any of you invested in BitConnect. Any of you invested in BitConnect? Part of it, oh, we have one. <laughs> Are you a scammer? Blockchain review, too. <laughs> no, 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 it's a story. <laughs> yeah, so they, after BitConnect came in, right, there was also other scams such as OneCoin, and there was maybe a couple of projects in Thailand that looked a bit scammy and not really right to the ICO world. So I see, hence, ICO model uh, idea was kind of being flushed out in today's world. So the main part is to pr protect, the, prevent the scam ICO, first of all. And then also to protect the re retail investor from investing in this scam project. And also we, uh, with the portal, right, we, we want to make sure ICO walk the talk. So what does that actually mean, though, is that uh, sometimes you see the roadmap in the ICO is very dreamy. I don't know if they can do it or not. Like, what, who makes sure, right, in the ICO world, what is the project doing really what they claim to be doing? So one of the role ICO portals is to make sure I, that ICO actually walk the talk between what they wrote in the roadmap, white paper, they'll follow it through accordingly. And if not, they cannot do it, and we also have to explain to the investor or the community why they're not being able to do that. So in the ICO world, in these things, right, ICO walk the talk, normally, if a very honest ICO, right? I read a couple of projects before they came out and they actually said it themselves that like, this, this project won't work out, we are very sorry, this happened, and explain themselves. But a lot of time you'll see ICO just slowly die out and fade away into like a uh, anomaly in today's world. Yeah. So who, who need, actually need to go through the portal in Thailand and when to approach a portal? So basically, uh, any any ICO legally wants to launch in Thailand, so have to go through the portal at the moment. So if you an ICO and you want to launch in Thailand and you don't go to a, a portal, it's kind of like uh, not legal. Legally wise, it's not right. And then uh, when you need to approach a portal, is this point it might be debatable, and I might I'm not sure when this can be changed or not, right? So we can. Uh, so when you're in the pre-ICO phase or the really private in initial stage, right, you can start approaching a portal, throw some idea out that you're interested in launching an ICO, and just t have a talk with few portal first and check 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 it out first, like serve the market. So, but just to uh, reconfirm, right, if you want to launch ICO in Thailand legally, right, you have to go through a portal. But there are also like uh, other way to go around as well, <laughs> as you know, yeah. So other question that we get a lot right, when talking to various uh, ICO, potential ICO, is, is that what if I don't go through the ICO portal, what will happen? What I can do or what I can't do? So what you actually cannot do is solicit Thai investor at all if you're not applied or go through the portal. So what I mean by that is solicit means is that uh, you cannot host any public event. So let's say you're going to talk about ICO today, right? 
you are doing ICO, you want to sell your ICO today in, in this room at the moment, it's legally not allowed. But there are cases that people do it without the regulator knowing, which is not really fine as well. So actually you're breaking the law of the country, right? So technically you should not do that. So you cannot do any roadshow, publicly sell your ICO, but you can talk about your project in a technological sense, but not selling your ICO per se. So there's a fine line between that as well. Right, so next I'm gonna talk about the bit, a bit of like the process of going through the portal. So it's just, uh, it's just, it's really an overview and we can have a chat more afterwards. Like, because the process is actually quite long, and like quite a lot of details, so I'll just sum it up into like a one slide kind of thing. So basically, uh, if the key process going to portal, right? Uh, for the portal itself, we have to do a strict due diligence on the project. So we have to scan their like uh, financial background, do some due diligence on market testing, technology analysis. So we have a internal uh, technical like due diligence report that we have to do internally before we accept that ICO to go through a portal. So this is normally like a couple of feedback bouncing the idea around within the team in Icora itself. So we have like around 10 people reviewing the ICO, potential ICO coming in, and uh, frame it out according to the team advisor, their background, their technology, their uh, partnership, or whatever they claim that they're able to do, going to do. So once that, that is done with, by us, right, we will go through with them the whole process of white paper review, and uh, white paper review in this case is according to the SEC requirement as well. So we'll prepare the ICO for the white paper to be sent to the SEC. So this part is not controlled by the portal per se, so it's more like a, a bottleneck to the SEC. So norm normally they'll take about uh, two to three months, right, to approve an ICO, right? Just be confirming with, yes, okay. So once you go through a portal, it probably takes two or three months to go through the SEC as well. So uh, you gotta mind that uh, time frame in your mind as well. So, and then after that, you the portal has to be facilitated of token, uh, token sale and distribution, the smart contract creation and audit. So if the portal doesn't create the smart contract, right, we audit the smart contract, and then we make sure everything is clearly, like they say they're gonna create 100 million coin, is actually there, 100 million coin, uh, person ABC get this discount. Like, so just make sure investors get the right amount of coin and uh, being like everything is verified by the portal, basically. And then after that, once we are done with the token distribution, we also have like a post ICO support with the ICO company as a portal. So according to the guideline by the SEC, the portal has to take care of the ICO for one year. Take care mean like, uh, Basically, just invent, uh, update the investor of the roadmap or the SEC, what is actually going on with that ICO. So with our current framework at Acora, we plan to do like a quarterly uh, report on that ICO, basically. So kind of like in a stock market world where they have the Q1, Q2, Q4 report. So we're gonna do the same thing with the ICO report, basically. Just to update the investor what is actually going on. So this kind of makes sure that the ICO is actually walking in the talk as well whatever they came in the white paper. And also if they cannot do what they say in the white paper, this will this part will be like uh, justifying why they cannot do this or why they have to deviate from their initial plan. So it's kind of eliminate out the scam a bit and then make sure people, the ICO company actually doing what they claim to be doing. Yeah. So that's some key process of going through the portal. So it should take about the, from step one to four, it should take about two, uh, three to four months and from the step five, once you're launched already, right? So the portal will be with you, monitor you for one year, basically. And as I mentioned before, all ICO issue in Thailand must be verified and certified by portal and must be approved by SEC in order to do any marketing material. So we can talk a bit about the pros and cons of going through the portal and what's the benefit or uh, what's the not so benefit or the pain point of going through the portal. So this is a very quick summary of what I think personally is the main benefit. So benefit on the left and the negative part might be on the side, you can call it that way. So 
So the first part of main benefit of going through the portal is that you kind of eliminate the scam. Maybe not 100% per se, but I would say 99.9% that, that I still want, it wouldn't be a scam. Because you cannot really guarantee anything 100%, right? Like in case they're still scamming people, but it's most likely if they go through a portal, it's, it's not a scam project. Because uh, we have like very strict due diligence process, and we work with the ICO like closely to make sure it's not a scam. And also the uh, other part for this one is that uh, the benefit is that it protects the retail investor from losing a lot of money and knowing what they're investing in. So once you go through the ICO portal, right, with the portal process, uh, they have a limit cap on the retail investor of 300,000 baht. Also, apart from that, also you have to take like a certain like a risk awareness task that you know that uh, you're investing in ICO is quite risky, right? So it's just to make sure investors know as well. So it's kind of help protect them. So this other part might be a bit controversial. It uh, might be a benefit to the ICO itself because it's trying to legitimize the ICO itself. One day pass through the portal, they can claim that they have been verified that by the SEC, by this portal, certified them. So it's kind of kept, give them a stamp and they can also do use that stamp for marketing purposes all over the world. And also uh, with this uh, benefit is also you can host public events in Thailand and do like PR without anyone like saying you, tell you stop, you know? <laughs> yeah, and the, probably the uh, disadvantage might be the a bit tedious process of uh, documentation. You need to go through the, the portal and working with the ICO portal per se. And also it might take like uh, two to three months to get uh, at least minimum three months to get approved by the SEC. But also if you think of it at the hand, right? if you're not even past the portal, you can still do your public marketing outside Thailand anyway. So it's kind of being like a parallel thing, but you going on doing a roadshow all over the world, also going through the ICO portal itself as well. And also from, if, let's say for example, this one, is might be lesser trust in ICO, it might be a hard word, but I would say like, uh, if I'm from Thailand, right, and there's a Thai ICO coming out, and they somehow decided to list themselves a Cayman Island, and not go through the portal and try to raise 30 million, right? I would be like a bit of red flag for me, right? Compared to the same kind of ICO going through the uh, listed, they can be registered in uh, Singapore or whatever, right? But as long as they show some intent, right, of like trying to force themselves through a portal, or try to go through a portal, might me, make me feel as, as an investor to be like more safe. Okay, there's actually a portal looking at this ICO instead of me and making sure they're not really a scam. So it's kind of like a two source thing as well. And also you cannot do any public event without the, going through the portal, so it might be a disadvantage at the moment. So I would say like the main outlook for the going through the portal or not to portal, right, is basically what we see a lot happening. Surprisingly, as an ICO portal, is first of all, right, uh, I'm seeing a lot of international ICO coming to Thailand to actually go through the portal, which is quite surprising to us. Because I have, I've met ICO from Korea, from China, from even Singapore perhaps, that they're like, you got a portal license that I want to go through you. So it's kind of see that, like, make us see as well that Thailand, with this ICO portal concept, right, it's kind of attracting all this play around the world as well to be like, okay, let's go to Thailand and go get ourselves through the portal and let the world see that we are actually not a scam. It's one way, one way of the game, which is quite surprising to me as well. I was like, why would people come through the portal and like, yeah. It's kind of like maybe like a long process for them, but they, they are like, yeah, they, I want to go through the portal voluntarily and let us monitor them as well. So with that trend, right, international ICO coming through the portal, we can also safe to say that a lot of projects are looking into Thailand and looking to launch through the portal in Thailand as well. I think in future we might see a couple of projects coming in. And apart from that, with the trend of upcoming trend of SDO uh, that Nicole had mentioned as well, we can see a lot of uh, prominent role portal play as in this part as well, that getting the right SEO in, doing the right due diligence. Because with SEO, it's more like uh, you're doing uh, profit sharing, dividend kind of stuff, right? So they have to really go with the strict uh, due diligence processes and really be let investors know what's actually going on. And apart from that, uh, surprising, once the portal 
regulation has been launched, right? Like uh, announced. We also been getting a lot of feedback from reverse ICO project, mainly listed and non-listed company or, or like big, uh, small, medium enterprise that are looking to go IPO in the future, uh, seven years down the line. But at this moment, they are like they want to do an ICO first as a jump ship phase before they do an IPO. So we're actually seeing a lot of these companies coming in and talking to us as well once uh, we are being approved as a part of that. So that's it for me as an outlook of ICO portal. All right, thank you very much. Thank you so much as well. Speakers, no introduction needed. Big button. Big one. One more time. All right, so um, the only one between you and your pizza tonight. So I'll be quick. <laughs> Um, my name is Anchisa, I'm from the SEC Thailand. I work with the FinTech team there. We've been developing um, the ICO uh, digital asset regulation for a while. So um, let's get started. Somehow it goes back. Okay, so um, a lot of questions right, come up from um, a lot of people who come and talk to us after we have the regulation in place. So what now for digital assets, um, especially in Thailand? So I would like to start with the why. Um, a lot of people ask us as well, why are we coming up with the regulation? Um, most of the regulators around the world are still um, unsure or unclear about what they're gonna do with digital assets. Um, mostly if it falls under, um, if it falls, if it's deemed as securities, then we regulate it with the uh, existing law, security laws. Um, but if it's not, then it's kind of like, out. Um, in the wide, right? There's no regulation for it. Most of the regulators around the world are um, taking the wait and see approach. Um, some regulators um, choose to ban it. Um, some countries ban ICO totally. But we choose the other path. We choose to regulate it um, and not just uh, digital assets that are deemed securities, but everything. And here's why. So we started looking at ICO in mid 2007. Where, um, and the trend last year was an exponential growth, right? You see in 2007 when it was a really good year for ICOs. And that kind of raised concern about us um, in many ways. Um, one of them is um, the, also the problem of uh, having scams, so many scams in place. And that um, raised our concerns. Also um, before that, we also have a listed company interested in doing ICOs. And because we started um, looking at it for a while when it came out, um, it also um, gave us um, the many concerns as well, not just only scams. Um, so scam prevention is definitely one of them. Um, and, but there's also other problems, for example, um, information and transparency. Um, before the regulation, there was nothing, right? Like you can basically have an idea, publish a white paper, um, raise fund and disappear, or you cannot just not give any information to investors um, enough for them to make a well informed decision. That's our second concern. Um, the third concern is that there are uh, also professionals um, in the market, people who uh, offer um, that advice, for example, people who try to be ICO portal, people who try to be an exchange providing service for investors. Um, but there's nothing to guarantee, right? For example, if you open an account with an exchange one day, the next day they might just close their website and disappear. That's quite scary. And the last one is the market integrity, of course. We want to maintain that. We really, really believe in the potential of blockchain, ICOs, digital assets, and we truly believe that um, with regulation, we can add value. Um, and it can help um, the mainstream actually feel confident enough, feel safe enough to come to this space. And that's the reason why we actually come up with the regulation. So it's when initially when we was uh, looking at it, it was only ICOs, right? 
But then there were so many news that kind of not only alarming us, but also other policy makers. Um, one coin, I think everyone in this room knows this. Um, we have got a call actually uh, to the SEC. There are emails also asking, oh, have you heard about one coin? Someone asked me to invest in it. Is it real? Can you give me some advice on that? Um, and um, the person who called uh, might not have learned about blockchain enough. So when you ask that person, like, so how did that person who told you about one coin tell you to invest in it? Um, did they talk about like opening wallet, you know, like blockchain, or, like how to transfer cryptocurrency? And they said, oh no, 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 no. The way they do it was like they set up like a line group, and um, they asked me to go into that line group and then send their money to Pompey. Okay, that's that's quite scary, right? There's also um, a lot of other problems that are related to uh, business provider in the space. Exchange got hacked. Not enough cyber. Uh, not enough um, securities. Um, insider trading um, um, in the exchange or front running problem. Who knows? You're opening an account in the exchange. You send in your order first, but then there's a guy right here who's my friend who's sending another order. But because he's my friend, I can put his order first. If there's no regulation in place, who's gonna guarantee that quality, uh, that standard is in place? So as a result, we come up with the digital asset regulation. And not only just looking for digital assets that are deemed security, but digital assets as a whole. Because there are also other problems. You have um, digital assets that are kind of like money, but still is not accepted as a legal tender, right? So that's, um, in the um, traditional sense, it will fall under the Bank of Thailand. If it's security, it's fall under the SEC. So there's a confusion here about who's um, regulating what, who's looking at what, and it's not gonna work. So therefore we have this regulation and the main responsibility for digital asset value is under the SEC. So at least people know where to call. <laughs> um, so um, it's also about what are we actually regulating, right? So what is digital asset? Um, so in the regulation, we specify into three things. First is cryptocurrency. Um, second is investment token, and third is utility token. But currently, if you're gonna do uh, ICOs, um, we are only uh, looking at the uh, digital assets that have the element of fundraising, um, and that would have to comply with the SEC Thailand uh, regulation. So um, the decree goes to main things. The first is about digital token offering. And the second is about digital asset businesses. So uh, in the offering part, right, we're actually looking at two main things. Um, the first is the company, who's the issuers. And the second is that, um, as Sanjay mentioned, we are approving the ICO portal as well. So these are two main um, people that we are looking at closely. And for the digital asset businesses, um, we're looking at the already existing players, which is the exchange. Um, we're looking at also um, the brokers and also the dealers. So what now, since we have the regu regulation in place already and it's been effective since May? So basically right now for the offering of digital token, um, remember we're looking at two people here. First is the issuer, right? So they would have right now currently, they have to be limited and public limited company. Currently, the MOF suggests that it has to be Thai company for Thai uh, entitled in, established in Thailand first. Um, secondly, ICO has to be approved by the SEC. As Sanjay suggests, the process can take up to three months, but it can also be shorter than that as well. Um, the offer must go through the ICO portal, and you have to submit the filing prospectus, which is like your white paper, and um, the cryptocurrency that we can use to invest in ICOs are the cryptocurrency in our list. Um, there are seven of them. And also, uh, we also specify investor type as well. If you're a retail investor, currently there's still a limit of uh, 300,000 baht per project. So if you look at the process, uh, if you're an issuer, basically if you start with idea generation, first thing you have to do is to go through the ICO portal um, Sanjay uh, clearly suggests what the ICO, ICO portal is going to do. Mainly, they would help you with 
as you're planning to look at your white paper, source code. After that, that would um, help you apply for the SEC approval. Then this process will take around three months, and you can start offering, once you get the approval, you can start offering um, your token to the public uh, through the ISO portal, who will help uh, performing the know your customers and also token distribution as well. So um, for digital asset bis uh, businesses, first it has to be licensed by Minister of Finance, but when applying, apply through the SEC. So you have to be in compliance with um, with our standards. You have to have adequate capital, proper risk management, you have to have the KYC process in place, and also uh, measures to prevent anti-money laundering. And currently, um, so far we have, um, because we already have existing player in place before this decree was effective, right? So people who have been operating before um, this decree came out in May, um, they can apply for a grace period, and we granted um, that to already eight digital asset businesses. And more are coming to apply, the new players are coming as well. After we issued the regulation, at first we thought like it might like um, make businesses run away from Thailand, but actually with um, more clarity in how the regulation is going, there are more people coming to talk to us. Uh, wanting to either apply for to be ICO portal or digital asset businesses. So I expect to see a lot of players coming into Thai market. Um, in terms of timeline, um, for ICO portal, we expect to see the first few ICO portal coming up uh, by Q4 this year. And you should expect to see um, first few Thai ICOs by Q1 next year. So. I think this is only the beginning, right? Like with the regulation coming out, um, it's the beginning of having some clarity in this space, but I truly believe that education is the key. So one thing that we want to do is to try to educate investors, um, especially in Thailand. Um, and we try to do a lot of education event as well. You would be surprised, um, you know, um, because after the regulation come out, people know where to come, right? So a lot of people like walk into the SEC or like they give us a call and all complain about like the scam cases um, that they have experienced. And we definitely would like to do something about it, but more so we would like to educate them so that they know enough to protect themselves. Um, at the same time, we have to admit that this is super new to us as well. And even though we have something in place, we still like have to continue learning. And the current regulation is not perfect, of course. For example, um, currently, you, if you want to do a public ICO, uh, or uh, you have to go through this process. If you have want to do just um, private sale, it's the same process entirely, right? And that's a bit inconvenient. Um, so we also like looking at um, the regulation that would provide more flexibility. For example, if you're gonna do your pre-ICO or private sale, there are uh, upcoming. Uh, regulations that are more flexible than this. You might not have to go through all this um, whole process, or um, we, have, we are more relaxing on this closure requirement, for example. And in addition to that, we want to also provide more clarity. For example, um, Sanjay mentioned, what's cons considered solic soliciting in Thailand, right? Like, can you host an event? What kind of advertising can you do, right? We are developing a guideline as well, and hopefully we can provide more clarity for the space on what they can do or what they cannot do. Right? I, I really believe that people would like to comply if they know what to do. So I take it as our fault, actually, if we don't provide enough clarity for them to be able to do so. So on top of that, we are also looking at asset back tokens. Um, it will. We will need to also like review and then uh, learn more about this. And also, there are also some challenges in terms of how we can amend the law to accommodate it as well. But there are interests already. People are already coming and talk to us about real estate back token, commodities back token, or STO, right? Um, but with the current law, we have to admit that there are some challenges. But we are trying to um, make it possible. In addition to that, um, we see digital asset as, 
has on its path to maturing. So in the beginning, it might be totally separated. Capital market are offering different products. Um, people who invest in capital markets are different. For digital asset, um, it might be some tiny group of people in the beginning, um, all the geeks investing in, in it at first. But as it's maturing, um, we see the two trends converge. And we want to be a part of this. And hopefully, uh, we can learn a lot more from the community to create a sensible regulation that will accommodate the ecosystem to be able to get the most out of these opportunities. Thank you. informative everybody's topic was so informative I know you guys might have a lot of questions for our speakers tonight and this will be your chance so I'd like to welcome up all our speakers including David as well Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I hope you're ready to ask some questions, and I hope you guys are ready to answer some questions. <laughs> so, oh, okay, I have two questions. First question, when will the first ISO portal go live? Second question, who will establish the fees for ISO portals? Will it be the same old portals? Will they establish it by themselves, or will the SEC regulate the prices of the services? I think for now, let's say uh, most of the startups, I think, at the moment, they have they operate from different hubs. 
So they don't have a single hub for all these activities. So let's say even in Vietnam, most of their companies are covered in Singapore, and mostly they have to follow with the Singapore rules. So they, back in Vietnam, then basically they have to follow with the normal compliance, like you know, as a foreign business, because they have set up the hub there. I think it's also a strategy of the companies when they want to structure where would be the best location to do certain activities. Um, so I think that it's gonna matter, you know, depending on the on the company itself and also depending on the country whether they want to miss out on the opportunity of attracting more companies in here. I think, for instance, with Thailand as a foreign business, I think that Thailand so far it's not the best country in terms of foreign business friendliness. But as with blockchain and this regulation, I think somehow with innovative technologies and somehow the government has opened door to some of the companies in this space. So as a company, I think we are more for confident to come here. But uh, we'll have to see the regulations in other countries as well. Yeah, just to add a bit on that, like we have like a couple of clients coming in from like uh, China, Korea, inquiring of, about the like, process of getting through the ICO portal. So once we talk to them and try to find out, right, why, why, why they here? They're like, yeah, because you guys have a portal and then we'll be legal, you know, <laughs> kind of legalize themselves through a portal in a way. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes? Please also direct your question to who you like to answer your question. Proof of stake? Uh, yeah, totally. I, I, I'd love to. Yes. A, a question about tech. My time to shine. Okay. Uh, so uh, essentially, uh, because uh, blockchains are distributed uh, ledgers, uh, and uh, essentially uh, with a public blockchain, it's run around the world. And so storing stuff on it is very, uh, very costly. And so you essentially have to have a way of determining who gets to store information on it. And so proof of work is one way to determine who gets to store information on it. Uh, and so how that works in practice is you have miners who run uh, specialized hardware that solves uh, essentially uh, computational problems. And if a miner solves a computational problem first, they are able to propose a block. So they essentially take uh, people's transactions, uh, usually in order of transaction fee amount, because they're trying to make the most money possible. Uh, and then they collect them, they make a block, and then they submit that block to the network uh, with their solved computation. Uh, proof of stake works a little differently. Uh, it fulfills the same purpose of uh, determining uh, what gets included in a blockchain, but as opposed to using mining hardware to solve computation, you have validators who put in collateral. So they essentially lock up some amount of value, and then based off that, uh, they are essentially allowed to participate uh, in both proposing blocks and validating blocks that others have proposed. And then if enough validators or enough uh, economic weight uh, signs off on a given block, then it gets included uh, in, in a blockchain. And so yeah, Bitfish will essentially be participating in that, running, a validator, running validators. Yeah. Uh, but for the proof of stake, right, there won't be any rewards, right? So will be there any rewards for the proof of stake algorithm? Uh, Mining will be there for if a proof of stake comes to Ethereum? Uh, uh, okay, so your your question is, will proof of stake replace mining? Yeah. Uh, essentially, so uh, initially uh, Ethereum was going to go to hybrid uh, Casper, which was essentially a combination of proof of work and then using a proof of stake mechanism for finality. Uh, but the majority of blockchains that are launching uh, using proof of stake are purely proof of stake, uh, and with Ethereum with Shasper. Uh, essentially, uh, proof of stake will be a shard, uh, and there, at least for the time being, will still uh, be mining. Although, yeah, we'll get a finality from the random beacon uh, proof of stake Ethereum shard. Okay, so so what's the progress on like the development of second layer on Ethereum, um, specifically for for OpenSQL, and you know what's the Working right now. Uh, what? Uh, so, what's the progress on layer two scaling solution? 
solutions yep. in general? Uh, yep. With pla uh, plasma in particular? Yes. Uh, so essentially, it's uh, coming. Uh, Kelvin, another, uh, another researcher from Misago, actually wrote an excellent blog post uh, on uh, essentially why uh, performing general state transitions, so essentially Ethereum virtual machine functionality uh, on a plasma chain uh, is uh, right now, uh, we're, we're not able to do it, and he has a nice blog post in terms of why it's difficult. We are able to do simpler things, such as UTXO payment blockchain. Uh, and so currently uh, in the process of extending those simpler things uh, to support a decentralized exchange. Yeah, happy to give you more details after. Sure. I just had a regular question. Yeah. Uh, what are the regulatory questions? <laughs> Actually, that's, that's the part where we need to actually provide the, the clarity <laughs> to the public on whether like, oh, like, it's really going to have to go through our regulation or not. Um, but so far, there's like certain criteria on how you do the advertising as well that will be counting as soliciting uh, for, for Thai investors or not. Um, I can give an example. For, for example, if that ICO is, has like a Thai uh, document, uh, then, then that you can kind of like sense that it's actually targeting Thai investor, or if it's like court uh, against Thai bar, like for example, like one token for how how many bar, um, that we can view that there's an intention to solicit Thai investors. Um, that those are the cases that are obvious. But then um, for now, um, we're still looking at like as a case by case basis. So if you want to do that, um, feel free to come talk to us and and and, and see if um, that would be. Um, under for the disregulation or not, or like maybe how you can, if you don't intend to solicit high investor, um, what you can do to not um, having to comply with our current regulation. Yeah. But we are coming up with a more specific guideline um, very soon. selling anything to anyone. It's like giving out free stuff. Like, yeah, so I don't think you fall under this. Or, um, but, but after the airdrop, um, yeah, you, you do something else and yes, that will fall under us, right? But at the end of the road, if it's an ICO, then once it, it, it falls under that, then it will have to go through the regulation anyway. And um, because it has to go through our approval, we also like would consider those airdrop or bounty program that you offer in the past, right? Because one thing we don't want is that, oh, uh, perhaps you structure it to give like a lot of token out for free, whereas the other have to pay. And then people who got it for free can just like dump it later on. That's what we don't want to see. So we took that into we we'll take that into consideration when we are considering the approving of the ICO as well. Yeah, but uh, usually, as you said, uh, those are the things that help you to market the product. It helps you to market the ICO and get more awareness. Mm -hmm. So as you said, it's very important. So without that, most of the ICOs don't have so much of exposure. Unless uh,
understand that. We don't prevent that at all. which is like they want to list their tokens in, in Thai exchanges. Um, that part, um, as you can see, we have the license exchange. And before they are granting the, rec the license, they would have to show us their listing rules uh, or requirements. So we're just looking at that listing rules, but then whether the decision whether they would list that token into the, that the exchange or not would be up to the exchange. But um, they would, it would have to comply the rule that we approved earlier before we grant them the license. So if they pass out the requirement, sure, they can just list on the exchange. Um, people can invest in the secondary market as they wish. For bounty program, that's tough. There's one more question now with the ICO portal, right? Uh, they actually do a KYC and give you a rating for each of the ICOs. Uh, do you have an expert panel or something? Oh, in for the ICO portal, okay, yes, right? If you want to come and do us, we have like internal team about ten. Who's the internal team? Like so our, our team, the ICO so it's com not, portal company team. Is it is it like a community that's uh, already been regulated or people know about those experts? Because we we go to ICO bench, and when we go to ICO bench, we have experts there that are recognized yeah. by the community. Yes, yeah. so I mean you can claim the, that, right? Uh, ICO is <laughs> <laughs> I mean. It depends on how much you pay them. It affects the Yeah, yeah. So if you come through the ICO portal, right, we'll rate you internally with you. And that's uh, being accepted by the Thai SEC now. I mean, that's a two different part, right? As long as uh, we try to do, do a due diligence on the ICO company first, right? Rate so the investors you. have to believe in what you rate. So the number doesn't go right? public. Yeah, that so member doesn't go public. Well, it doesn't go public. Yeah. yeah. It's just internal between us as a company. Why? And you all send the rating to the ICO? Pardon? You all send that rating to the ICO? Yeah, yeah, we do when you come to us, right? We do like a. Like a report. Yeah, I like a report. You can say it's like feasibility report kind of thing. So my take would be that it's not the offering to the general public, right? Basically, people like that person would have to provide you with some work, and then they get the token return. So it's nothing um, like the public offering of, of the token. But it's just like, instead of you paying with money or with Bitcoin, you pay with your token. So I don't think it would have to go through all the whole process of public offering. I think the exact question is um, for utility token. What, yeah. Because that's a utility token you're talking about, the utility, right? Mm -hmm. So does that have to go through like, the portal? For, for utility Because if, if, if you're just giving away a token for a pass, that's a utility token. So what is the, what is the rule for utility tokens? That's what he's asking. Yeah, I mean, I think it's two different things. But just because you're giving people your token doesn't mean that your token is utility token, right? Like, yeah. But for a task, if you're going to do some reading, Get rid of token. That's not investment. Yeah, but you you're giving it as like a return for people who are like doing some tasks for you. So in a real example, you can give them like gold, you can give them noodle or, or what or what whatnot, right? It doesn't make it like it's it doesn't change the um the right um that the token holder get from holding the token. So even if, like it can be a securities token, but just because you give like I'm giving it to you, it doesn't change it to utility token. 
uh, actually I got a question for you, right? Um, for the Baldis, right? <laughs> I mean, if, if I'm doing a Baldis, like let's say you know, like I post online on my channel, right? Just to do, uh, just, you know, just to get in ICO, right? We will get in trouble because basically I'm promoting an ICO in yeah, exchange for. <laughs> yeah, so when you run a bounty program, you run it on different platforms, and each platform has uh, certain standards that you got to follow. So it's not that you just give away free tokens to everyone, it's only the ones who meet the criteria, right? So it kind of works advantages to the ICO as well as to people who need the exposure. So why would you hesitate not getting it? Like are you saying that you won't have a allow people or allow ICOs to have bounty program? No, I'm not saying that. Okay. I, I think it can um yeah it ICO can have bounty program but then um it has to be like appropriate kind yeah, of so there is a there yeah. is some criteria right, right. listed. Yeah. So that's fine, right? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, so um, uh, current requirement is that uh, any company who, who wants to do an ICO in Thailand needs to establish a, a limited company in Thailand. What about the foundation? But hey, what if uh, homies like Go would do ICO legally? So they, in Thailand, can you know, they establish a private um, Company in Thailand, and then this company is just going to make all money to the country in Switzerland. It's possible. It's legal. <laughs> so right now, the law just specify it has to be like the um, uh, the limited company established in Thailand. Um, with foundation, I think like we have to explore further on like what we're going to do with it. Well, we can say in the white paper we're going to donate it to the foundation. Yeah, I mean, if you say that, like, like daily, open what? source, decentralized, mm -hmm. ICOs, ICOs are free. Yeah, so, <laughs> so with the rule right now, you have to be, like, Thai company, right? Like, a um, limited company or um, Thai PLC. But then whatever you're going to do after you raise your money, um, if you clearly stated in the white paper, you got a proof of us, you can do as you stated in the white paper. Okay, I think we need another dialogue to discuss about the tactics to circumvent the obvious regulations that we're talking about. <laughs> so, uh, please have some other more questions, which are, you know, kind of more inclusive, so that we can discuss, you know, some other things around this policy. So, we're going to talk about it later. Yeah. Okay, so how are we going to bring the, the expat blockchain community and Thai blockchain community together? Because we're uh, segregate. All right, yeah. Finally. <laughs> <Point man. laughs> Well, basically, um, the event like this, you can see you know, a mix of people. Um, I mean, we, we can see in our experience, right? We have um, you know like um, English oriented event, um, Thai oriented event, but we also have something like um, the project event where we have a translator. I mean, just the case, um, bringing them together really you know just you know like uh, putting you in one place, right? You have the same interest, and then you yeah, then you just talk to each other. And also, you know, like working with Nicole as well, like you, you can see that, you know, we bring in new and more and more communities that we never met, right, uh, new faces, you know, in one place. And uh, we believe that, you know, Big Fish not going to really have this event. There can be more and more event, right? So, um, I mean, it's going to be a mix of people, right? I would say that this is the most uh, local, e local event that I have been to. Like, I have <laughs> never seen these many locals in a room, like in an event like this with blockchain in English. So I would say that the content, whether it's re as long as it's relevant, uh, I think that this, for, for instance, in this case, then of course I think that whether it's a, it's a local or it's a national, then we, we would be able to have more, like, better settings, right? Yeah. Um, I
to disagree that they actually split. I mean, they, they do have a drama saying that you know mining is better than trading or <laughs> trading is better than mining. I mean, that's that's. I mean, it's an international problem. But I, I don't believe that the people really you know like uh, really divide it like that, right? Personally, I do mining plus trading. It, I don't think it's really matter. I mean, I think the most important part is that as long as they can find a community to ask questions, if they want mining, then there's a mining community. If they have questions regarding trading, then they go to the trading community. Um, I don't really see that, um, anything necessary to actually combine the two. Like we do have a group in Thailand that you know, like combine everything and it's amazing, right? And when people create a specialized group, people tend to you know, like that group and they join, right? So when they have questions regarding mining, I go to them. I would say that things tend to get a bit more uh, exclusive and more complex and trickier uh, as soon as not only uh, do you have these ideas and these, uh, these uh, essentially concepts or these visions that you feel passionate about, like blockchain technology will revolutionize the world in X, Y, Z ways. Uh, but then as soon as you start to not only believe this very strongly, but as soon as you start to identify with this and as soon as you attach your identity uh, to it, then it becomes a lot more difficult to talk about, say, mining uh, with people who share different beliefs about how mining should work or with traders. And uh, you kind of come more from a place of ego as opposed to a place where you're essentially trying to expose more truth uh, and essentially reach a better understanding. My two cents. Yeah, totally. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, essentially, uh, humans uh, are very good at building uh, closed systems. We are very good at creating uh, centralized servers, and we create, uh, we're able to distribute databases uh, and mess with permissions so that multiple uh, parties within a company or so that multiple um, companies can interact with one another. Uh, I would say uh, the super cool thing about blockchain technology, at least for me, is once you get into public uh, blockchain technology, because then you start breaking uh, down barriers uh, to entry. Uh, as soon as you start uh, talking about private blockchains, that is almost automatically uh, exclusive of sorts. Uh, and I'm not saying that uh, all your information or that all your transactions should be public. Uh, but I definitely think there's value in essentially uh, looting, uh, looting your value, looting the transactions you're doing, and essentially looting uh, real world bi business in public blockchains because they offer more interoperability, uh, they decrease uh, the barrier to entry, and the more people who start using them, uh, you get more and more economic security. Uh, yeah. Plasma chains are very cool for kind of <laughs> going in between. Uh, so essentially, you can have a company can have a plasma chain that they run, where essentially they're doing transactions on it, and those don't have to be public. But then, if anything goes wrong, you get uh, the force of Ethereum and economic uh, economic security of Ethereum uh, for arbitration. Can I add a bit into that? I mean, personally, right? I, I don't believe in and the reason is that just really simple, right? I mean, why blockchain? You want to do it private, right? I mean, the, the, the bank, right, trying to do private blockchain for, so that you know, their BAU is easier, uh, maybe faster, maybe cheaper, right? But when you talk about public blockchain, you talk about actually removing the bank, right? You're open for anyone in the world to access this payment system, not exclusive to just someone who uses the bank. 
right? not for the dentist to transfer with each other faster. So I view that you know it's just more exciting to see how with blockchain and I think it, it, it's actually competing with things. Really. Unbank, bank. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I think that's all the time we have before our pizza gets cold. 
before we do split, um, let's all take one group photo together. Is that possible? Can we all just squeeze in here by the LED screen and take a group photo together. Also, ladies and gentlemen, please fill out your surveys and give it back to the counter. But for now, let's, let's gather together and take a nice photo. Everybody knows the rules. Tallest in the back, shortest in the front. Nicole knows. She knows her height. She knows where she needs to be. Yes, please, ladies and gentlemen, let's, let's squeeze in here. Our pizza is waiting for us. Yes, please, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you know.